I'm going to be telling you about batch systems, which you probably have come across already. So batch systems, as you'll see, are an important part, sometimes a painful part, but a uh, critical part of being able to use an HPC machine. And it's useful for you to know a bit more about what goes on behind the scenes when you run your jobs on an HPC machine. So what I'm going to talk about is what are batch systems? What are, what are these things? Why do we need them? Then I'm going to go into a bit of detail about how to use these. You've already done this in, in one of the, sort of the practical um, but you'll get a bit more of an overview of what the underlying concepts are, what's going on under the hood, say. Um, that will involve talking about resource scheduling and the execution of your jobs on the machine. It'll talk about the job submission scripts that you create to run your jobs. And it will also talk about being able to use interactive jobs. I'll say something about scheduling, um, all that is involved in, um, in scheduling jobs. I'll give you also some tips about best practice, um, which is not necessarily cheating. It's just good, good practice about how to use a scheduler to your advantage, or at least how to use the system to, to your advantage, how to make good use of the system. It's good for everyone, not just for you. Uh, there'll also be a note about some common back systems and some of the differences between them. So, what is a batch system? It's essentially a mechanism to control the access to a shared resource. In this case, a shared computing resource. Um, Archer, for example, has these compute nodes. Everybody wants to use them. Everybody gets accounts. If everybody just fired up all the work all at once, uh, the machine will grind to a halt. So you need some way of controlling access to the machine. Essentially, what it provides, what a batch system provides, is a queuing system or scheduling system for the jobs belonging to users. So batch systems are also called batch scheduling systems or scheduling systems or schedulers. These are just interchangeable names. So what a batch system does is um, it manages the, the reservation and efficient allocation of resources and it manages the job execution throughout the entire lifetime of the job. It allows people using the machine to essentially submit, uh, fire or forget, uh, whatever simulations they want to run, um, which may be individual, large, long ones, or just huge, massive uh, arrays, um, that is to say, huge, massive collections of, of, of jobs. Uh, and they can, just, they can just do that, and they go, go about their business. So um, it allows you to use the system efficiently for production runs. Instead of on your laptop, you just sit in, sit there, have this very short feedback cycle where you, you build your code, you run it for slightly, you run it a bit, and then you see what the output is. Oh, you tweak it a bit, see what the output is, see, tweak, tweak it a bit, see what the output is. This is not typical of, of uh, at least very large HPC machines, where typically you've gone through an initial stage of doing that, perhaps even on a smaller cluster, or, or, or on your laptop, uh, or on the machine itself. Um, but you fire off these big production runs that get your, your massive simulations done. I've already said a bit in the last slide about why we need batch systems. This is a bit more um, of a rationale. So it's about, it's about giving people, um, giving users a fair share of these resources, because as I said, demand usually exceeds the supply. This is to make sure that, it's also to, to make sure that um, the machine is used as efficiently as possible, but it, that means that, as you can imagine, so you've got jobs of all these different sizes and durations that people want to run. Now, if you simply put them all in, that the first job that gets submitted is the first one that runs, you're not going to make very efficient use of the system. It's like playing Tetris. I mean, I don't know how many people have, have played Tetris, but possibly quite a few. And it's a bit like you have all these blocks, different sizes and shapes, right? And if you just let them all come down at the same time, then you just fill up the screen, and it's really inefficient. You don't use the space efficiently, and it's game over. Um, but the scheduler has to try and um, basically do what you do when you play Tetris. It's also used, so batch systems are also used to track the usage of individual users or um, groups of users. Um, that can be for, for accounting because ultimately this, this costs money, right? And um, budget control. So if somebody submits a job and they have no, they no longer have any, um, any budget that they uh, were initially allocated to be able to use the machine, then their job gets, gets rejected. It doesn't just, just run, even though they run out of money. 
Um, and it's used also to mediate access to other resources than simply uh, giving you a compute node to, for your simulations to run. Namely, it can mediate access to uh, software licenses so that a certain group of users might be able to use a license, another group of users might not. Um, it can uh, give access to different portions of the machine, as we'll see later. Um, so how do we use a batch system? I mean, this, you probably you came across this before. You came across this yesterday. You basically you specify your job. You say, okay, I want to run my job. Um, so your your job consists essentially of two things: commands to the scheduler to the batch system, which specify. Um, so I'm saying this. Start with the first thing I'm saying is the second bullet point: the specification of the kind of the compute resources that you need for your job. That is something that you're telling the scheduler. You're telling the batch system. My job needs these resources. That's the information that it needs in order to be able to schedule your job. And then, perhaps more important, well, just as importantly, the first bullet point here: what you need to tell the the, um, what the specification of your job involves just simply you know whatever commands you need to do to run your simulation, which might involve pre-processing some data or setting up some some input parameters, which you might grab from wherever. Um, Creating some input scripts, input data, actually executing the simulation, perhaps doing some post processing, etc. That's step one, you specify your job. Step two is you submit that job to the batch system. You go, okay, this is my job, please run it. So that job is then placed in um, a queue by the scheduler. And the scheduler will execute, it will eventually execute that job whenever it determines that there is um, space and time available on the machine according to some scheduling policy, which we will get into later. The job runs until it hopefully finishes successfully. Uh, it could also be terminated before it finishes due to some errors, or it could be terminated because actually the commands that you gave to issue to run your simulation end up taking 12 hours, whereas you actually only requested in your job specification to the scheduler for the job to run for eight hours. So, um, so you've lost all, that, uh, lost all that time, perhaps. So the job might get terminated that way. Then step three, once the job finishes, you examine the outputs from your job um, and any error messages, error messages that might have arisen. So um, if you, this is a visual representation of that kind of workflow, the batch system flow, typical setup. You, as you can see this, so you, you write your job script, you have some command, and this, you've, you've used QSub, so for an archer, QSub, or some other command submits your job to the system. Your job is queued. It gets tagged with, a, with an ID. Um, while it's in the queue, you can check what the status is um, using some kind of job status command. On Archer, that was QStat, or is QStat. Um, then at some point, the job executes. You can still check the status, and it'll just say, okay, I'm executing currently. And it might output some files uh, while it's running, and once it finishes, there's some tidying up, and it might output some further files, possibly error messages as well. And throughout this entire uh, life cycle, as soon as an ID is allocated, you can typically delete the job and say, okay, I've changed my mind, I've realized something is wrong. Um, so the Archer command is QDEL for that. So, this, so the batch system allows you to, just, uh, to monitor um, uh, your job through the life cycle. Uh, some systems provide even a web interface or a mobile app, uh, so you can get text messages. Uh, you can you can many batch systems you can configure them. When you submit your job, you can get the batch system to email you when it goes to when your job gets starts running. You can you can get it to email you when it encounters an error. You can get it to email you when it's done. These kinds of things, so you can get notifications. You can go off and do whatever, and you get a message saying, "Oh, my job's finished. Oh, great! I finished my coffee and go go check the output." Um, and as I said, you can cancel the job when you notice a problem. So let's uh, talk a bit about um, resource scheduling and the execution of jobs. So, as I said, when you submit a job, you, you specify what resources it requires, which can be a uh, number of nodes or cores, the duration of the job. Then the batch system um, uses some policy to, to schedule a block of resources that meet these requirements. So it, it says, okay, therefore this, these requirements are needed. This, this will need to be available for this job to run. Uh, now, 
the distinction here that, that I'm trying to make is that there's a, there's a distinction between the, um, the resource requests that you make for a job and the actual, um, what you do with those resources once, you, once your job runs. So you say to the scheduler that my job needs this. The, job, the scheduler doesn't, the scheduler is further, more, further blind to any commands that you're going to run during your job. It just, only information it cares about is what you've told it you need. Once your job runs, you are free to essentially use those resources that, that you've been granted in whatever way you like. So you could run um, uh, a, single, a single calculation or single um, executable, say that, span that uses all the nodes or all the cores that you've requested during for the entire duration of the job that you've requested. Or you could run multiple shorter calculations, each of which would span all the nodes. You could run those in sequence. Um, each shorter than the total duration of the job. Um, uh, those, yes, you could run those in sequence, or you could run those in parallel. So you have a lot of flexibility. But it's, it's important. The important distinction here is that there's a distinction between what you tell the scheduler in terms of your resource request and what you then do with those resources once they've been granted uh, at runtime. So it's useful to go through a few concepts uh, associated with batch systems. So a lot of these are very intuitive which you may have, may have picked up already, but it's, it's useful just to make them explicit uh, because um, a lot of them are not specific to Archer, but they're a bit more universal and they kind of apply across different batch systems. So it's useful to just have an idea about them. So Q is, is a very is a universal um, term concept. It's just a, a scheduling category, um, which could correspond, for example, to a portion of the machine. machine. Um, so queues can be set up to have different time constraints. For example, you might have one queue uh, where jobs can only be can only be submitted that um, run for a very short amount of time. Or you can have a special queue where only jobs sit in that can run for a long period of time. So you know, this, this can be configured by the um, by the providers of the of the machine, by the system administrators. Um, for example, something else you could you could facilitate access to by by a distinct queue is nodes with special features such as large memory uh, accelerators. So you can have a separate accelerator queue. So jobs that use accelerators get submitted to that queue. Jobs that don't use accelerators get submitted to some other standard queue. Uh, you can, for example, reserve nodes for, for um, guaranteed access, immediate access for a uh, subset of users, for, as, as, we, as we've done for this course for, for training. Now, uh, HPC machines typically don't have a huge number of uh, different queues. That's usually sort of a small number of different queues. And uh, jobs contend for resources within the queue in which they sit. So that, that might seem obvious, but basically you submit to that queue, so you're only competing for uh, resources with other jobs within that queue, typically. Um, yeah. So yeah, on Archer, for example, there's a standard queue which if you don't specify um, if you don't specify a queue, then by default your jobs get submitted to the standard queue, limit the time limit there for your jobs to 24 hours, and, and basically you can use the, the standard compute nodes of which there are of the order of 4,000 available. That's the maximum number of nodes you could use in such a job. There's a special short queue, which is uh, implemented to provide a quick turnaround access, uh, not as quick or guaranteed as necessarily as the reservation we made for this training course, but it's, it's similar. Um, your jobs can only last 20 minutes, and you can only use up to a maximum of eight nodes per job. Um, and that is available um, only during weekdays from nine to eight. It's a long queue, which allows 48 hours instead of 24 hours. And a large memory queue, where we have some nodes on Archer that have 120 gigabytes of RAM instead of 64 gigabytes of RAM. So if for some reason your job uses a lot of memory, then you can submit it to that queue. Um, of course, that might mean it can take longer to schedule if it's um, if there are a lot of jobs like that. So, so you might make have to make a choice whether to optimize your simulation somewhat and use a standard limit. There's also a serial serial queue, which um, actually Archer has sort of two serial nodes, which are we discussed further. I can just mention those later. Um, so. Another batch system concept, kind of universal concept in a way, is, is the priority. Um, this plays an important role in uh, the scheduling and when your job actually runs. 
which is the thing that most people care about most uh, when it comes to scheduling. Like, what, what is my job going to run? So the priority is kind of a, is a numerical ranking of a job uh, made by the scheduler, and it influences uh, how soon it will start. Um, if, 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 it's, if it's got a higher priority at a given time, that means it's more likely to start soon. It's not deterministic, as, as we'll see these scheduling algorithms are quite complicated. And all you can say is really that with higher priority, you're more likely to start sooner, but it's, it's not a guarantee that it will start before a lower priority job, actually. Um, some some batch systems make this allow you to see this priority explicitly to actually view what it is. Others for other systems for other batch systems, this is just something that's kind of computed internally within the algorithm. So this is um, so the way it's implemented differs, but it's universal concept. Um, and obviously, as, as your as your job sits in the queue for a longer amount of time, it accrues increased priority. So that's as it sits out longer, it's more likely to 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 run. Um, Oh, universal thing that uses account name or budget code. These are just things for, for accounting. So basically, that you charge the compute time you use for a particular job to uh, some kind of code that then gets charged in terms of actual money to time you can allocate on the machine. Um, so, and wall time duration of the job. Um, wall time because it's the wall clock effect. How much, how much time your job will actually take when you look at your watch and clock on the wall. So these are things that, that you need to specify when you submit a job, typically. Okay, so let's look at some examples of using uh, batch systems. A bit more concrete. So I already gave some, sorry, I already gave some examples of, uh, of commands. So I said for Archer, so the, 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 the batch system of Archer call, is called PBS, uh, which stands for Portable Batch Scheduler. Um, and there the commands for job submitting is q sub. So q sub some job script. So the job script, as we'll as we've already seen, contains both things that I mentioned. A, the resource specifications of the scheduler, B, all the stuff that you want your job to actually do. Uh, in in Slurm, which is a different um, scheduler, uh, the command is s batch for submitting jobs. And again, you have some kind of script which just differs it, which is does the same thing essentially as this job script with PBS. QStat allows you to check your job, and you can typically say give it the job ID, or you can have a flag dash u, which, which and then specify your username so that you see all your the status of all your jobs. Similar command of Slurm is SQ, then there's a command for QDEL, and then job, job ID, the number you fill in, can uh, delete the job, cancel the job, and Slurm is S cancel. Uh, when you check the status of the status of the job, um, you know, you'll get some abbreviated information, so you'll see if you're if an archer and you're looking at your jobs and you type QSAT and you see that the status is, is Q, that means it's sitting, in, sitting there in the queue waiting to run. If it's R, that means it's currently running, great. If it's E, it doesn't mean error, which you might think it says E, if it's something wrong, no, error, it doesn't mean error. E in PBS means exiting, so it's finished running and it's in the process of exiting, which basically means that it's, it's tidying up some stuff and it's going to soon be finished. Um, so F, um, F would be finished. And then um, H is held. And held just means that the job um, is currently not eligible to run, which could be for a, num a large number of possible reasons. But it requires some intervention, typically. So um, I said that, uh, I said the two things were the commands, the, the research request to the scheduler, and you've got commands that actually say what your job does. Now, commands that say what your job does typically involve one of these parallel application launcher commands, such as MPI run, AP run, MPI exec. So what these do is, if you think back to, to using MPI programs, um, this comes from the idea of just launching um, uh, for individual processes. So um, for MPI run dash MP48, or just 48, uh, MPI ranks essentially, and then there's a, there's a flag dash PPN which says how many of these processes should be uh, launched for each node. So there should be 12. This specifies that on each node there should be um, 12 MPI ranks, but a total of 48 uh, nodes, uh, 48 ranks. On, a, on Archer, the, the the command that 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 Cray has has constructed uh, as an analog analog to this is AP run. And again, here, this is the N48 
specified 48 MPI ranks. The DAC capital N12 says that you want uh, 12 MPI ranks per node. Um, dash D2 is, is, a, is, is a command that has to do with the OpenMP threading. So um, we'll get to OpenMP threads later today, but um, basically um, the dash D spaces out your ranks so that, is, that allows uh, the two different say, say that each say that you say that the number of open MP threads for a program is two. That means that each rank will have two open MP threads. And the dash D2 option basically spaces out your ranks across the cores on the node so that um, uh, each open MP thread for, for a rank sits on its own core rather than getting squashed onto a single core. Excuse me, what yeah. is the benefit of using these, uh, uh, these kind of uh, so are you asking about the difference between your, would you are you interested in, interested in the difference between AP run and MPI run or just why you use any of them at all? Yeah, why for example uh, when I run in Nash I just put AP run and the yeah. number of yes. multiply the, the number of nodes mm -hmm. by the multiple uh, twenty four times the number of nodes that I want. So mm -hmm. I never use this kind of command. What the dash capital N, you mean? You never use yeah, that just, one? Yeah, just the yeah. dash capital N plus, and the number of, the total number of nodes. Yeah. So what, what, if I use this, what is the benefit? So the benefit is that, uh, so by default, the capital N is set to 24, okay. which means that, that it, by default, it launches 24 MPI ranks per node. Okay. And that is chosen to be the default because it's sensible because an archer, assuming you have well, an archer, each node is 24 cores, right? So that would mean that each core has one process on it, one MPI yeah. rank on yeah. it, which kind of makes sense. Um, for pure MPI code anyway, that definitely makes sense. Um, now what you might like to do, as I just described, when you have a hybrid program that includes MPI and OpenMP, uh -huh. you might like to have fewer than 24 MPI ranks per node. Okay. For example, you might like to have uh, uh, 12 MPI ranks per node, because what that allows is that there are 12 MPI ranks, but 24 cores. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And now that's useful because if each MPI rank itself creates two open MP threads, then those two open MP threads will sit, each have their own core available to them. So you see, so each MPI rank has two cores essentially available. Mm -hmm. So each MPI rank has two cores available, and it's form, it creates two open MP threads, and that means that one of those open MP threads, each of the each of those open MP threads, will have its own core, and that's good, because that means that's that's typically much better than than if you had 24 MPI ranks each having two open MP threads, and that uh, that would mean that those two open MP threads for each rank are com are sitting on the same core, and that typically isn't very good, isn't very fast. Okay, so later on we can get the little bit exercise or. Yeah, I think. I mean, we can talk. I can talk. I can talk to you later. I mean, it also allows you to. What it also allows you to do, even if you, even if you're not talking about OpenMP, what this allows you to do is to spread um, your simulate. So to use fewer ranks per node means you might use less memory yes. less per node because each rank might have an amount of memory associated with it. Mm -hmm. And if you have 24 ranks on the node, that might mean that you run out of memory. So if you have a very big problem or for some reason your code does something that just requires a lot of memory. Whereas if you then, if you have fewer, say you have 12 or four MPI ranks per node, that might mean that you can, you can actually run your simulation because then the, the total amount of memory used on that node, it fits, total memory required on that node by the four MPI ranks fits within the memory available on the node. So there's just, depends on your application, there's these trade-offs. They have some input files. So they okay, we can yeah, look, look at this later, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's an example of a jobs emission script. Um, probably seen seen some stuff like this already. So for PBS, uh, the first line specifies which uh, shell is going to be used to execute the commands in script. Um, in this case, bash bash is very typical. That you can also have um, other shells. You can even, you can have Python or Perl even if you want. Um, at the bottom here is the first the command that actually runs your, your simulation with the AP run saying I'm going to launch 4 to the 800 MPI ranks and I'm going to run my weather simulation code. 
Uh, you've got a statement here, a line that tells the scheduler that the wall time for your job is one hour. There's a command uh, to change to the directory that you uh, originally submitted the job in, which in PBS doesn't, doesn't go to by default, so you have to tell it. Some other schedulers, it automatically jumps to that directory, so that's something that's peculiar to PBS. Um, there's a line saying how many nodes you want to use. So in Archer, in Archer, in Archer, the basic unit of allocation is a node. You never request less than a node. This is actually quite a quite a useful thing to talk, to mention because um, uh, on some systems you have exclusive access to a node, meaning that your job, uh, if you if you ask for a node, you get that entire node and nothing else runs. Nobody else's code runs on that node. That's the case on Archer. On some other systems, other people's code runs on that node. You name the job, as I mentioned, that's a shell, and that's your actual um, number of instances or number of ranks. And there's a statement saying which queue, so this is going to run in a short queue, which actually would fail larger because here the time is set to one hour, and the maximum for the short queue is 20 minutes. But it's just an example. Um, yeah, name here. So for Slurm, it's very similar. You just, it's, it's just the things are called slightly different. You use MPI on a different machine. Um, you might use MPI run. There's nothing to do with Slurm that has to do with the machine. So you request your job duration using this dash dash time command. You um, submit it to a special queue, the dash p Tesla, thought it isn't meant to be accelerators. You select two nodes, give it a name, using bash, 24 instances, uh, 24 tasks uh, per node, and the program name. So I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, so, right. um, so far I've talked about batch jobs, which you write a job submission script for, and then you submit that, go do your own thing, come back later, and it's done. Interactive jobs can also be very useful. They're used for testing, development, and visualization. So most HPC machines allow both batch and interactive jobs. Batch jobs, as I said, are not interactive. But interactive jobs are useful because you can just try things out and they immediately get feedback. So how these are set up in charge varies from machine to machine. If um, if it's set up so that interactive jobs um, are scheduled in the same way as batch jobs, then you just simply need to request from the schedule that you want an interactive job. So you use similar variables. So you have a Q sub command, and you have a, on Archer you have a Q sub command for PBS saying dash I for interactive. You select how long, and you select how many nodes, budget, and which queue. You wait until, you might have to wait a bit, and you have to wait until the scheduler says that the resources are available. So it's only when your job, when your interactive job runs that you actually get a prompt at the terminal that then allows you to start typing it out and using those, uh, that's the one node that you've selected um, interactively. And then you can use, uh, you can launch parallel um, uh, executables using AP run, MPI run, for example, just as you would in a batch job. So there may be a small part of the, uh, of the machine dedicated to, to these jobs. Um, okay. Scheduling. So how does the schedule actually decide uh, when to run a job? So this um, is actually quite complicated, it's more complicated than you might think. So the scheduling algorithms are try to um, ensure maximum utilization of the machine, because ultimately, at least with the current generation of machines, you're paying always for the power. Unless, unless nodes can individually power down, you're paying for the electricity. So you want to make good use of the, of the machine. Um, you want to also maybe perhaps optimize to, to, to minimize wait time. So uh, batch schedulers can be configured to implement a particular scheduling policy. So scheduling policy varies from machine to machine. So a smaller cluster a uh, regional cluster or a university cluster might prioritize uh, small wait times and might say, okay, it doesn't matter whether the job is big or small, we're going to treat those equally in terms of assigning priority to them. Other machines like Archer might assign more priority to big jobs because that's what these machines are, are essentially provisioned for. So you can emphasize different things, large jobs, small jobs, long jobs, but short jobs. You can also opt to prioritize certain power consumption or other metrics. Um, now, to, to give an idea of how complex these things are, the PBS um, documentation is quite comprehensive. The user guide for PBS is 350 pages. 
the reference guide, it's not a great reference guide, the reference guide for PBS is 500, over 500 pages, and the system administrator's guide for configuring PBS is 1,000 pages. So it's, um, it's complicated, basically. There's a, there's a useful thing to be aware of. One of the aspects of many scheduling algorithms is something called backfilling. This is a, an algorithmic strategy in scheduling. Um, in, and what it does is it, it improves the utilization of the machine. So what, what happens is that, okay, you assign jobs prior, some initial priority according to a scheduling policy that emphasizes either large or small jobs, whatever. Now, if you have a, a high priority job that can't actually run right now, simply because given what, else, what, given what is running right now, given what resources are, resources are available right now, it cannot run right now. What the scheduler does is it says, okay, right, the jobs that are currently running are going to finish then, 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 which means that at that point, later in time, I can run this job. It says, okay, that's, that's what I'm going to do. It, that big job, that high priority job is going to run at some point in the future, maybe uh, 24 hours from now or 12 hours from now. In the meantime, it will try to fit less high priority or lower priority jobs into the gaps that are left by jobs that finish before that high priority job is scheduled to start. So as you, as you can imagine, there's gaps that start to emerge because some jobs finish, and then it tries to fit uh, other job, uh, lower priority jobs into this. This is called backfilling. And what also might, this, this might be jobs that are already queued, it might be jobs that get submitted in the meantime between the initial scheduling point that I talked about and the point in time when the high priority job starts. So somebody might submit a job and they might suddenly run. And then their, co their, their colleague who's just you know, sitting next to someone, they just submitted the job and it runs and you get annoyed because you say, well, my job's been in queue for ages. Yes, that's because maybe your job's really big, so the scheduler needed to wait to get, you know, schedule the time. Um, and that's why sometimes lower priority jobs can run sooner. Uh, this really improves resource utilization. Uh, scheduling algorithms are complex and an active area of research. Um, there's a status page, page on the Archer website, which gives you some information about the current status and historical status as well of the queues, uh, which we can look at the next slide. So the question is, how long does it take before my job executes? Um, so uh, this is data. This is data from Archer um, over the last year, statistics over the last year. It's, uh, the thing that's computed is a scheduling coefficient. Scheduling coefficient is kind of a bang for buck. It's kind of how how happy you should probably be um, from zero to one <laughs> about your about your job. Um, if you're if you if it's zero, which is with red, then that means that you submit a job which might only take a minute to run, but it sits in the queue for ages before it runs. That would be really annoying. Uh, one means that the amount of time um, uh, essentially means that that it sits in the queue for a vanishing amount of time, for really, really small, hardly any time at all. Um, so that, that most of the time uh, that it sits, that's submitted in the system is just, that it goes to the system is just a runtime. So that, that's great, one is ideal. So you can see if you look on the y-axis, you've got the actual, the, the runtime of different jobs, so bin from zero to one hour, one to three hours, et cetera, all the way to 24 to 48 hours. On the x-axis, you've got the size of the job that was requested uh, by users, one node, two node, all the way up to um, yes, we have no, okay, it only goes up to 4,000, over 4,000 nodes. So you can see that uh, large jobs here in the right bottom quadrant, large jobs uh, for a long time uh, have a high scheduling coefficient. They, in a sense, and that's uh, that's a reflection of the fact that the scheduler prioritizes, the scheduler on Archer prioritizes um, long-lasting large jobs. Now, large jobs that are um, very short are very difficult to schedule um, because you, you, there are, when you submit it there at any given time there are lots of jobs that need to finish running before it can run so there you have to sit you have to wait a long time typically and then there's some, some in between area so you can look you can look at the statistics um, on the actual website for this and on a weekly basis monthly basis etc now quickly some some best practice uh, tips for using HPC batch systems uh, try to run short tests first before you submit a job script for a massive job. So otherwise you might end up uh, it might end up failing or it might end up running for the entire duration of the job but actually produce a wrong result. You might have done something wrong and then you're wasting a lot of resources. 
So test stuff first, then write JavaScript for big, big lines. And you can do a lot of stuff using the Linux command line uh, and bash or Python or Perl that's available in scripts. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, and just be careful when you test, um, be careful when you move, copy, or delete important data because you have to realize that whatever your job's going to need needs to be available at the point in time when it runs whenever it does run. You can't just sort of have some stuff there and then submit the job and then just move it, right? If you need to leave it there for the job to use by the time it starts to run. Um, okay, I'm going to, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, my notes on migration. So all that's worthwhile saying here really is that there are different batch systems. They're quite similar in some cases. Uh, Slurm, I already mentioned Slurm, the SunGrid engine. Um, you can manually convert your scripts. There's also a utility available. If you look at the slides, they're available on the website. You follow that link. Um, it's also available in Archer, this thing called Bolt. It automatically tries to translate job scripts from one batch system to another. So just to summarize then, well, uh, why do we have batch systems? Well, they stay, exist to manage the shared access to resources um, and to maximize utilization, to make sure that these machines get used efficiently. So uh, the batch systems allow you to allow you just to submit stuff and then go away to the thing. So um, yeah, there's no need to stay logged in um, and actively monitor your jobs. There are a number of different batch systems, as I mentioned, but they all work broadly the same way. Um, there's just, you know, always keep in mind, there's just two aspects of re requesting the resources and then specifying how to actually use those resources in your job script. And finally, um, uh, the scheduling, as, as, as annoying as it might be sometimes to wait for your job to sit in the scheduler, um, you just have to trust that these scheduling algorithms are behind the scenes doing their best to make use of the machine in the best way possible for, for everyone, according to some policy that's determined by whoever paid for the machine or whoever has a stake in using the machine. <laughs>